Welcome to Health System CIO's Partner Perspective Interview Series. I'm Anthony Guerra, founder and editor in chief. Today we're talking with Ryan Witt, VP of Industry Solutions for Healthcare with Proofpoint. Ryan, thanks for joining me. Anthony, it's great to be here. Look forward to the conversation. Excellent. You want to tell me a little bit about your organization and your role? Sure. Uh, uh, let's go with the organization first. Uh, Proofpoint is very focused on what we call human-centric security. This notion that uh, the attack service surface has pivoted to attacking people, attacking humans, uh, and how they work. Uh, and so we're all about uh, protecting those people uh, from, from cyber attacks and, and defending the data, which is so frequently the focus uh, of, of cyber criminal uh, activity and, 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 and exploits. So it's all about protecting people, defending data. Very good. And you have a new title. So you want to talk I about do, that? Yeah, from healthcare. Yeah. So let me, let me elaborate that as well. So my, my, my role within Proofpoint is uh, we have a, a, a deliberate focus on a small number of industries, uh, healthcare being being one of those. Uh, and so I run the strategy and solutions for those industries, making sure that we are enhancing the experience for customers who exist within that industries. And so we double down our efforts from a um, go-to-market standpoint, from a product development standpoint, so that if you are a healthcare industry customer, you should be able to discern an enhanced experience uh, about work from working with Proofpoint. And as a byproduct of that, I also run uh, Proofpoint's Healthcare Customer Advisory Board, healthcare being the only industry uh, that Proofpoint has a dedicated advisory board for. So we take our strategy and solutions, we run it past uh, this advisory board, get some feedback on that, and that shapes what you ultimately see in the marketplace. All right, very good. So we're going to sort of sort of take this in a prog logical progression as we analyze this issue of security around email and people and that type of thing. Email is still the main way we communicate when we do business. Um, we all know about the spam filters and things like that. There's, It's also one of the major attack vectors, right? It's the way we do business and it is one of the major ways that we have security breaches um, is through that email. So. We want, as security professionals, we want the good emails to get through, which is also a critical point that's come up. We can't have that that lever too tight, that dial too tight, so good emails are being rejected, which which can happen, and they're going into spam and whatnot. We want to make sure the good stuff's getting through and the bad stuff isn't. Um, and two ways we kind of do that are one with technology filters, and the other way is employee education. So um, does that sound about right? I just want to sort of set the stage before we go into some more uh, nuance and detail on this. Uh, tell me your thoughts on that sort of premise. Yeah, I, I think that sounds about right. Um, I, I think the first thing to maybe focus on, at least for a moment or two, is despite all of the different forms of attack, despite all of the, um, the different exploits that get captivate people's attention um like i for example i you know i i we, we just came through the holiday season and a lot of my friends family loved ones who have nothing to do with it or cybersecurity, you know they know about say ransomware attacks um and so those kind of th those things captivate people's uh, knowledge those things become kitchen table sort of topics the reality is um phishing and attacking people mostly on email or other communication channels, it is still, you know, by a significant amount, the most popular and most um, prominent form of attack vector. So it's one that if you can only focus on one and hopefully you don't have security architecture that allows you to only focus on one, but if you had to just pick one, to double down on, it would be, it would be email and mm -hmm. it would be really the way people Look, those are the way people are attacked. Email, let's 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 add in other communication channels as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, when you get to what are the sort of controls, what are some of the measures that the defenders can put in place to mitigate against um, that form of attack? It is a blend of processes. It's a, a, a blend of technology and it's a blend of training. And you, can, you need all three. All three are important parts of, of, of the mix. 
but we we would we would suggest and a lot of the data that's out there from all the independent organizations that report or provide um, points of view about where the cybersecurity landscape is most prevalent, we, we would recommend a strong layering of your of your security controls to protect against that sort of attack vector. And, and yes, you, you certainly want to make sure that you have your dials set to a point where you are uh, keeping as much of the malware, as much as the um, uh, nefarious traffic away from your users so they don't have to make a judgment about, hey, is this a good or bad email? You don't have to add that complication to their work life. And the reality is that um, some will get through. And so then you need to put steps in place. You need to, you need to train the user um, in a way to allow them to have a considered judgment about what they might do next if they're if they're have a concern about an email that hit their hit their mailbox. Right. So so we want we do our best to keep the bad ones out, let the good ones in. We know that some of the bad ones are going to get through. That's just the way it's going to be. So we layer on education, training, processes so people learn how to deal with the bad ones. Okay. So we have that as a premise. Um do you also think that um, the sort of chat GPT AI type stuff being leveraged by is being leveraged by the bad guys and supercharging the scams, the spear phishing and whatnot, making them more intelligent, more believable, uh, more convincing, and perhaps even expanding it to uh, expanding the pool of bad guys because Perhaps previously you had to be sort of a native, know English pretty well to structure an email correctly. Maybe now with some of these tools like ChatGPT, you don't. And so you got more people now that can run these scams and they're getting more sophisticated. Is that all true? Does that make sense? You, you allow me an opportunity to give you my favorite answer. Please. Uh, yes and no. Okay. I do a lot. You do do that a lot. Let's go. I love it. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> uh, Yes, and, so, and certainly um, we should not mitigate or should not diminish, I should say, the prevalence of chat GTP, chat GPT and other sort of AI tools. Um, it's it's interesting, however, that I think the most recent, recent Verizon IBDR report, you know, one of the seminal sort of studies that look at the cybersecurity landscape, I, I, I'm paraphrasing here, but they made this statement along the lines of, you know, we could cut and paste. Oh, it saw that. From our, yeah, yeah, from our executive summary from two, 2010 and put it in this year's executive summary because nothing has really changed, right? The old school attacks still work in the way that they used to work, um, you know, 15 years or so ago. Um, and yes, things have evolved for sure. But the reality is phishing is still the most used um, attack vector. Uh, it is still working. It is still super impactful. And so the, the bad actors don't necessarily need to take that step to AI just yet because that just elongates and complicates their, um, their, their, their processes and it could impact their ROI. And I hate using those sort of terms in, in relation to cyber criminal organizations, but the reality is they kind of think of themselves as a business. And so... But that's not to say that's not coming, for sure. AI is coming, uh, and it is essentially we are in an arms race. Mm -hmm, yeah. The, the attackers and the defenders are going to are going to deploy AI as aggressively as they need to, um, to try to stay one step ahead of each other. Um, right now, there's an argument that says industry has more capability to deploy AI, has more funds to deploy AI, um, but I wouldn't. You know, that that if there's an advantage here, it won't last for long. The bad actors uh, are also going to are also focusing on that area, and, and 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 so I say that to make sure that we focus on where the threat vector really is most prominent. It's still going to be phishing. It's not so much around as the example that we saw very recently in the news. I think there were you know we're in, we're in election season. I think there were some robocalls that were. In, that were all deep fakes that were impersonating um, various politicians about getting people out to vote or you know campaign policy, whatever they were talking about. Um, 
so I, I, I would not, it's an interesting news story. It's not what today's attack vector is. Six months from now, this could be a significant way mm -hmm. that attacks are, are launched. So we should definitely keep an eye on it. All right, very good. So you have always, uh, you know, when we've spoken in the past, you've talked a lot about the concept of very attacked people and the fact that as a security professional, uh, it's not a one size fits all as you roll out your controls and tools and education. You really need to understand that there are certain groups of people that are much more at risk, much more threatened and much more attacked. And that will help you uh, properly configure. And I think you've used the word elegant and sophisticated in the past in describing how you should be rolling out your controls, keeping in mind this concept of very attacked people. Um, any updates on that concept or specifically in terms of who is very attacked? Sure. I, we focus on this for, for a couple of reasons. One is um, it's best to make sure your defenses are deployed where you think the activity is most active. So uh, we're now in the playoff seasons for football. If there's a football fan out there, generally a few of those football fans out there. Um, if you are playing a team and you know they run the ball up the middle and they're getting four or five yards a, a, a pop and they're going to keep doing that until you stop it, well, what do you do? You have to try to stop it, right? So if you have an accounts payable department or if you know that your pharmacy or your um, your hospice department are all heavily attacked from the uh, cyber criminal landscape, cyber criminal, and, and they are for all sorts of reasons, um, it would make sense to layer in more controls there to give more defenses to go help those employees, those members of staff to be able to protect against an exponentially higher attack number. So from a philosophical standpoint, Proofpoint very much believes that data in this instance really, really matters. Um, understanding that within your organization, there are people who are exponentially more attacked. There are departments that are exponentially more attacked, um, usually for monetization aims. And so they made, they made a conclusion about your organization that says, this person, this department can yield something to me in the form of data, credentials, intellectual property, whatever, that I can monetize that activity. So. We believe that when you think about your your security posture and your security architecture, that's like maybe the most important variable about what you do to, to to counter that. Now, what you do is a much deeper philosophical conversation, whether you pivot towards training, technology, you put interrupt processes in place that says, you know, don't interact that email before you take a take a, make a phone call, talk to a colleague, whatever. that's that's a much broader more philosophical discussion. Uh, so, but that's proof point starting points. Like having that insight is a really, really good variable to helping you determine your strategy. The second thing, and this really pertains more to healthcare, is I've been doing this role. I've been in self-care cybersecurity for almost 20 years now. I've yet to meet a CISO or an IT organization or a hospital executive team that says, hey, you know what? I have a ton of money. I have a ton of resources. I have a ton of access to technology. I can just put the gold standard everywhere. Um, and so it's usually quite the opposite. Um, the, 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 the people I'm working with are usually making trade-offs, sometimes significant trade-offs, having to really make a, a an educated guess or a judgment about which of their 10 priorities to get focus uh, this year from a, from an investment standpoint. Maybe they can only choose three or four. So we believe data like this provides necessary insight to go help guide, okay, if you can only focus on a third to 40% of what, you're, what you would ideally want to do, what should that third to 40% look like? Yeah, just a little more detail on that. Um, I think you answered a lot of what my follow-up question was, but it's around the downsides of not taking a customized approach. Um, and I'm wondering if you're not doing that, if you're doing that one size, you've mentioned you have limited resources. So if you have a limited resources, how does that practically manifest itself 
Would you be buying licenses, for example, for some type of technologies that you didn't need because these people are not attacked and they really don't need this extra layer? Obviously, you, if you're talking about training and education, you're spending time maybe giving extra training and education to people that don't really need it, whereas you could be spending more over here to the people that need it. Um, also, when we talk about controls, a lot of times, sometimes we're talking about slowing somebody down. They have to take an extra step. And you wouldn't want to make anybody take an extra step if they didn't really need to. So I, are those some of the benefits or downsides of not customizing? Yeah, let me give, let me give you a, a, a basic example, but yeah. I think it suffices for the, the conversation. Um, there, if, if you look at over the last um, five, six, seven years, where the expenditures happen most uh, uh, most predominantly in in healthcare and, and for many in many industries, for that matter, there's there was particularly five years ago a significant focus on hardening the network. Okay. And if we were to have this conversation five years ago, we would talk a lot more about uh, about uh, a vulnerability in the network being exploited, design being a little bit flawed upon reflection, patches that have not been deployed, bad actors coming up with zero days. Um, that doesn't you don't not we don't hear that anymore, but you don't really hear it that much is the reality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I think expenditure has also been slow to pivot. So we keep looking, we keep putting, a, 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 in some cases, a disproportionate amount of money into hardening the network. And I would never say that's not important because it is absolutely important that you harden your networks. But you have to look, maybe look at the balance. Let me give you another example. Um, we have all, I think, practitioners, though in cybersecurity, those people in healthcare, those people who offer opinions about the, mar about the marketplace have been very concerned about the attack of or the vulnerability of medical devices. Again, if you look at the reality, there are very, very few news stories around the attack came in by mm -hmm. an exploit in a medical device. Yeah. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's not important because it, it they're vulnerable and so they are inherently therefore important. And if you look at where the effort is or where the attack effort is today, I wouldn't unduly put too much investment there when you know, you can look at the the, the wall of shame, the OCR wall of shame, or look at what data HIMSS puts out. It's the initial compromise is almost always on email. Mm. So I think I think I think there are some downsides if you don't look at your attack surface and look at uh, where you have the most vulnerability and don't just pivot to this kind of one size fits all sort of approach. Right, right. Very important stuff. Very important stuff. Um, all right. So let's talk about. Uh, this sort of credential compromise. You know, we talked about email being the way they're coming in. What they want are the credentials, right? A lot of times that's what they're looking for, username, password. So yeah, that's mostly. the scam. Go yeah, ahead. Credentials, credentials have become the nirvana state for a threat actor, right? Right. Once right. they have credentials, once they have access to their network, uh, they have the opportunity to take the time and figure out how they want to launch their attack. And not only do they have that time, they have now a, a plethora of options to go upon the dark web where they can pick out whatever the right exploit for them to purchase. Do they want to get a ransomware attack? Do they want to buy a Trojan? Mm -hmm. Do they want to launch a fraudulent attack? Combinations thereof. And threat actors used to have specialization around a particular attack technique or or a, a particular exploit. And so they would just kind of like Kind of like rinse and repeat their one sort of stuff. Now they don't. Now they now they focus more on access, knowing that they can go acquire uh, exploits um, on the dark web, and so therefore do the reconnaissance, figure out where it makes sense, and then and then launch the attack. So they want to get the credentials to get in. Um, sort of an offshoot uh, of that is the the identity and access management. Um, process and that's very important right because you want if they do get all the credentials you don't want them to have credentials where somebody added on credentials year after year and they really didn't don't need 80 percent of them anymore but they have them and so you know you've got this these keys that get you into more rooms than they even should so that's a big process correct and maybe you want to comment quickly on the importance of identity and access management and i know it's a very complicated topic it's not easy not easy topic, not at all, no. 
No, I, 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 Ponymon is one of those organizations that that study this a little bit, and so I'll I'll, I'll quote some of their data, and I I don't know if I can get it exactly accurate, but I'm certainly within the ballpark, certainly mm -hmm. in, in the context of this conversation. So Ponymon would say, from a healthcare context, or their data, their survey, survey data would say, it takes about six months before a healthcare institution, a healthcare organization recognizes that they have a breach within their network. So somebody got in, somebody got some credentials, they've been, at least they've had the opportunity to navigate the network, go into the, you know, using your analogy, the various rooms and offer some reconnaissance, offer a point of view, make a determination about which room is most valuable or which room might act, you know, might, might lead to the crown jewels or, or at least valuable jewels. Um, and they have six months before you you as a defender recognize that. Um, so let's say they're right, give or take, all right? Um, that's still a long time they're active before we haven't had any sort of ability to, to make a determination and do anything about that. Um, if you think about that from a physical security standpoint, if somebody was active physically, you know, within the, the walls of your of your of your hospital or in your hospital building for six months, walking around surveying things before you can recognize what's going on. It's not a. It's kind of creepy, mm -hmm. uh, and b. But you can kind of you can kind of see. Well, that would be that's actually quite valuable from a data gathering sort of standpoint. You could see where, if you had that level of 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 access, how much harm you could possibly um, levy against that that institution, right? So if we relate this to credential compromise. Uh, practically speaking, this would be someone getting scammed, per perhaps in a phishing email, giving out their username and password, perhaps never, I, I assume, never realizing they were scammed, moving on with their life and they're working and their username and password still works. However, that's been compromised. They don't know. So they're not telling anybody. There's no effect because the bad guy's lurking around, not ready to make a move, just secretly moving around in the network. Is that how this happens? That that's that's one way for sure how it happens, and and the manifestation of that is quite significant because all of a sudden you can use this these credentials to not only navigate the network, but you can use these things to let's say if you're a I don't know I don't want to pick on Microsoft, but it is a prevalent sort of technology. They're using the Microsoft architecture to go load something on SharePoint or to go load something on Teams and say and they're, therefore they're communicating back to some of their employees, some of their staff members, the whole broad organization say, hey, this is, I don't know, a, a new travel policy, or this is a new expenses policy. Come look here and click this link. Well, if you're a receiver of that email, you're like, well, that that's the kind of thing I would expect that person to send me. Mm -hmm. It's it's housed in the right area. It's housed within our, our SharePoint environment. They communicated to me on Teams. It all makes sense. And I'm like, well, sure, why wouldn't I click that link? And then you could just see, you could start to see how now you're within the, the realms of the network and you have this exploit being launched against you. There are still some who would say, you know, I, I, my alarm bells are ringing. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But you can't blame the staff members who say, well, why would I question it? It came within my environment, you know? So it all yeah. looked legitimate to me. So there's no, there's no I mean, it would be obviously all awful and harmful for that to to have an attack go that way but they do go that way and I, i'm just trying to say you can't put too much pressure on the employer for doing something quote unquote wrong when it's all within their environment so yes not only can they can they do the reconnaissance but they can actually use that opportunity to go be pretty aggressive in the exploits they launch so uh, you know again progressing through this thought process what can security professionals do about the problem of credentials being stolen where the user is never aware they've been compromised. How do we as security professionals, how can we detect that credentials have been compromised? Um, how do we figure that out? And then what do we do about it? Right. So there are technologies um, around identity uh, defense detection and response that um, look at where are the most commonly exploited uh, vulnerabilities from an identity store standpoint 
And there are some common areas that you see attacked or you see these these cred um, fishes or credentials being being deployed uh, that you can survey. So your service accounts, your administration accounts, uh, anything that requires credentials, so maybe cloud credentials, um, legacy accounts, anything that has access back to back to the website. Um, so you can do some interrogation on the most common areas where where people navigate to. That's that's one way we look at. And then if you have concerns in this area, or just to offer a layer of, layer of defense in these areas, you could present a shadow version of these capabilities of these of these controls or, or sorry of these um of these access points back to a threat actor and give them the impression that they're navigating within your your environment your account payable system whatever sort of system you want to talk about your your EMR uh give them the impression that they're navigating this environment uh, but they're doing so in what is essentially a shadow, fictitious sort of network architecture and design. So they're they're navigating only within this this environment, and so therefore you don't have any undue exposure to them getting into your systems proper because now they're within this environment. And then you could use that uh, that knowledge to go for a couple of reasons. One is you could figure out well what is most interesting and attractive to threat actors? Like, what do they gravitate towards? So one of the things I think you and I may have discussed this previously is how frequently, for example, hospice departments are attacked. Like, mm -hmm. that's, that was a conclusion that initially surprised us. We did not think that would be a primary area of focus for threat actors, uh, but we've seen that come up time and time again. So it's through capabilities like this you understand where the where the the motivation is for the threat actor. Now, why they have that motivation, that's a different sort of conversation. Um, but then it allows you to to make that determination. And then it also allows you to the opportunity to um understand more about their organization, get them in a situation to potentially reveal more about their organization and from an audit compliant compliancy uh, dealing with authority sort of standpoint, this could be a lot of this would be really valuable data. Excellent. Excellent. And, and I'm just wondering, so some of the ways I would guess that you might detect that credentials have been compromised would be perhaps if um, the logins are occurring in two places at once. So Correct. I'm logged in as a user and the bad guys have it and they're trying to log in as well. The system should be able to detect that if the location of the login is somewhere unusual. Right? right that might be detected if and i this would be more sophisticated but if the user is doing things outside perhaps of a profile of what they know 100 100 work patterns is a big heuristics and work patterns and trying to make a determination like what would this person normally what right. does their whole work activity look like and is this in line with that 100 percent. yes and it's all got to be automated right we want the yeah, software yeah, yeah. that that does all this so you're getting an alert like joe smith is doing some weird stuff that he not, doesn't usually do. Ding, ding. Let's check with, let's figure it out. And then I guess the investigation begins. And to your point, sometimes we find out, oh, Joe Smith, uh, his credentials are being used, but let's put him in some kind of honeypot. I don't think you use that term, but maybe that's the wrong term. But let's put him in some safe sandbox and watch him. But put put the little cover on and watch. Watch what, what he or she is doing. And that will help us with our investigation and whatnot. For sure, for sure. And so, you start to see what we would, what we would have called maybe, I don't know, eighteen months ago, machine language, uh, as a uh, as a way of that we would automate a lot of this process. Mm -hmm. uh, now I think we probably would be more appropriate to call that AI, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. But there is learnings here. It's automated. It's trying to figure out where Joe Smith should be. Uh, from within your system, like where would he normally have access to and then where Joe Smith shouldn't be and making that determination from an, in an automated sort of way. Yeah, okay. So identifying compromised credentials. Um, let's talk a little bit about the idea of education around teaching users that if you think you might have been 
compromised. You're scared. You're afraid. You don't want to get in trouble, right? So I put my my information in this this email or website or somehow I went down a rabbit hole and did a thing. And I don't know if it was, it seemed kind of weird and nothing happened and I'm just going to forget it and move on. I, that may be an instinct that a lot of people have. That's really, really bad instinct, right? Because then they're in and nobody knows. And unless these technologies we talked about pick it up, you have someone in the network, as you talked about, six months and nobody knows. So I would imagine as security professionals, we want to do everything possible to educate the users that, hey, if you think you did something wrong, tell us, please. You won't get in trouble, but tell us. Does that make sense? That makes it makes total sense. And I can't stress enough how open you should be and transparent you should be with your IT teams. Your IT teams are not about employment employment and, and and securing your they're just about safeguarding your institution they really need as much assistance from you to the point where we can almost make this argument that everybody's second job these days is becoming a security professional because we're all we're all kind of part of this um defense mechanism that's so so crucial and I, and i think the reality is your it teams will already have a will already have a determination about your likelihood of vulnerability. So your IT team generally from a from a vulnerability standpoint will bucket you into at least one of potentially three categories where vulnerable where they look at vulnerable aspects. So so if you are a person for example who has a public persona for whatever reason um you could be a noteworthy um, specialist, surgeon, you could be a member of the executive team, you could be a noteworthy researcher, you could be somebody who raises money for um, the institution and the foundation, you could be somebody who who races in five and 10 Ks on your and your on your hospital's behalf. And so therefore, your name is out there. Yeah. You, you have this public persona for whatever reason. The reality is that makes you a much more significant target. So that's something that a consideration your your hospital definitely takes into account. You could be somebody who is the opposite, right? You don't have any public persona at all, but you work in a in a high highly targeted area. You work in accounts payable. You can approve invoices. You can approve payments. You can approve payroll. Uh, you could be an administrator to a particular system. The bad actors know who those people are and they target them more exponentially. Or you could be somebody who just works in a really vulnerable way. Like you're not doing anything wrong, but like maybe you're in, I don't know, you're in HR. Your job is to recruit people into your organization. So as a result of your job, you have to download files, download resumes. You have to go on to LinkedIn or Twitter or where, wherever a, a possible candidate might point you to go learn more about them. So again, you're not doing anything wrong, but you're downloading a file. You're clicking on links. You just work in a vulnerable way. So the, the point I'm trying, I'm trying to reassure people that there is an expectation based on your department that you are much more likely to be attacked. And therefore a lot of, there's a lot of empathy about, about your situation, your work situation, about how um, it's easy for you to come to fall foul of, of, of these attacks not you're not doing anything wrong but you're just you're just being targeted or you could just be someone like a nurse for example who you're doing a you multitasking constantly you have a thousand things you're trying to juggle at one point in time and easy to make one mistake yeah you know? so people empathize with situation don't don't be don't be fearful of your of your cybersecurity teams they're here to help you all right, Ryan, we're almost out of time. I just want to just wrap it up this way. Um, that sort of uh, very attack person concept, um, it, it applies before an attack it, or a compromise with the training, the tools, the education, extra protections for those people that are very attacked. And it also applies, it sounds like, after a potential breach uh, in the sense of monitoring the credentials of very attack people to see if there's anything odd going on with them. You want to keep a closer eye on those because again, they could be compromised and not know about it. Correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a good way. That's a good, that's a good summary. So if I could leave somebody with a party thought, maybe that was the question you were going to pose. Um, it's 
a couple of things. I guess maybe two parts. One is you probably have to make some trade-offs. You have to place some bets, however you want to phrase this. You're going to have to uh, prioritize where you make your investment from a cybersecurity sort of standpoint. So I would really encourage people to understand your vulnerability. There's enough data in the marketplace from Proofpoint and from others around where the threat activity is most active, where within your institution is um, most active. There's a lot of organizations that probably look like yours and have similar sort of challenges. Try to get that data because it it drives, it should, I believe, drive your, your security strategy. I'm not going to sit here and say, even though I work for Proofpoint, we have a bias towards technology. That technology is always the answer. It may not be. It's That's where you have to look within your institution and figure out what's best for you. But the starting point is that data. And I think the second thing to say in relation to that is if you can't get that data, if you're not sure how to get that data, you can call us. But think about what makes your organization special. Mm. What about your organization is attractive to your patient base? There is something about you, right? Something everybody's got something, whether you're specialized in a particular discipline or it's your location or it's the client base you serve, whatever. But if there's something that that you can make a determination that's special about your organization, therefore would be interesting from a financial standpoint, the threat actors definitely have figured that out. They think in that way. So even if you can't get access to this data, think about who would be more likely to be attacked from a person level or a departmental level. And if you can make, if you can see some things that are, would be attractive, they th that's probably where they're attacking. So that again, should be a data point to go drive your overall strategy. Wonderful, Ryan. Uh, another great chat with you. And I want to thank you so much for your time today. I really enjoyed it. Good talk to you.